Hello, BookTube. Recently, Michael K. Vaughn made a video, one of a series of videos that he's doing about all the stuff he still has to read. Uh, I don't know why he's making these videos of, uh, you know, the next 15 fantasy novels that I'm going to read, the next 15 horror novels that I'm going to read. Maybe it's that he feels his moral fiber weakening on the, on the subject of his 500 book challenge, and he's trying to buck himself up by reminding himself of how much great stuff he still has to read. <laughs> one way or another, the videos are wonderful. I'll leave a link to his down below. And the, the most recent one in the series was the big, fat anthologies that he wants to read. And I've been making response videos, sort of tongue-in-cheek response videos to all these. I don't like to pass up an opportunity to recommend books. Anyway, these are perfect opportunities. So I thought I would do a video about 10 or so fat anthologies that I can strongly recommend. Uh, we'll start with the first one. I've recommended this many times before on this channel, but some of you are new. We are slowly approaching 15K subscribers. I, uh, I'm uploading at the oddest times. I'm trying to step on my own content. It's still happening. Uh, but, um, so some of you might not have seen this, and I very much would like to remind the ones of you who have. This is Irene and Alan Taylor edited a big fat volume called The Assassin's Cloak, which is a big anthology of diary entries across history. So this is a year of, it's organized by a year, May 1st, January 12th, that sort of thing. And for each day, you get a string of diary entries from different period, different people and different periods in time. So you might get one day might have a diary entry by John Evelyn or Samuel Pepys. And then on the same day, you would jump forward 100 years. And then 100 years after that, you'd end up with Virginia Woolf or Alan Bennett. Uh, it's wonderful. It's endlessly browsable. Just endlessly so. I swear, if you put this thing in the stereotypically, if you put this thing on your nightstand and just use it as a thing to read every night, you will never be sorry. Oh my. I don't know how many times I've made my way through this book. I love it dearly. Uh, so, and it's a big fat anthology. Definitely counts. Then this next one is a big fat anthology of writers and artists it definitely counts a couple of things on here don't count technically as anthologies because they're all by one person but they're still compiling a lot of stuff by that one person this big fat anthology is going to be a little bit hard for you to find <laughs> let's just put it that way uh this is the colossal conan uh and this is the whole of dark horse's run on conan it's a big cinder block of a book of the dark horse run of conan comics so you, it starts off with Kurt Busiek and Carrie Nord in their great, much heralded run. It goes on from there. A whole bunch of other great people had hands in the... The Dark Horse Conan is really a monument to Conan pastiche, to Conan comic book adaptation. Uh, and at some point, some genius uh, decided, let's put all of those together into one book that's 1,500 pages long. <laughs> and they did. I remember seeing this in the listings. At the time, I was going regularly to my local comic shop, and we would go through... There's a a big paper uh, industry journal called Previews that shows you what's coming down the pike months ahead of time. Comic book store owners used to go through that, and my comic shop owner and I used to go through it together. I would go in every, every new comic book day, and when I was done, we were done chatting, we'd spread that thing open on the counter and pick out the things that I definitely want. He knew that I was not dreaming, that I would not make promises and then not come in and buy them, so he knew it was worthwhile to order a copy, so he would do that. And we saw the listing for this thing. And I thought, 1,500 pages, I wouldn't even be able to get it home. I'm not going to get that. No way, I have most of these things. Anyway, uh, and that worked out well. I have recently learned, I've recently reminded myself that big, fat, hardcover anthology like this do not do anything for me. They are too inconvenient for me to use. Now, some of you want these things mainly to have them, to put them on your shelf, take them down once in a while with great care, and open them on a table flat. I don't treat my books that way. I don't use them that way. I want to pull them down and carry them around, read them, use them. And you can't do that with a book this big. This must weigh six pounds. Uh, so I never really thought about getting it. Never seriously. Uh, and I have no regrets about that. But the collectors who didn't get this do regret it because it instantly went out of print and it instantly became collectible. And it's now very expensive to get online. <laughs> this is, this is, if you, you can find copies of this on eBay or the Amazon Marketplace or whatever, but it will cost you a pretty penny to get. And I don't see the use of it. Since it's too big for you to actually enjoy the stuff that's inside. But it is a big, fat anthology. <laughs> so I can't think of one much bigger. So I had to be, I had to be on this list. Uh, then we'll do uh, a big, fat anthology that is one writer. 
but it is still pulled together from many, many outlets, many journals and whatnot, many eras of writing. So I thought it may be counted as an anthology. This is The Essential Ellison. This is a big, fat volume of the science fiction writer and the columnist and opinion writer Harlan Ellison. Uh, this has a lot of his stuff. A huge, he was a hugely prolific writer. And you couldn't possibly do one volume that would have everything, but this has a lot. Including uh, a lot of his... A lot of the deadline prose that he wrote for various newspapers, where this is the only place you'll find it. And it's full of his inimitable voice. This is a, this is a, a big, fat volume to have, definitely. Uh, again, it's... it's Assassin's Cloak in trade paperback, in a UK trade paperback, is bearable. But this thing, it's not. I, I occasionally see this. The paperback is too big to hold together, first of all, for the kind of reading that I do, where I want to open it wide so that I can annotate in the margins. And the hardcover is too heavy. It's too big to use. But science fiction readers definitely should have this volume. There are, there's, what, maybe 30 volumes that science fiction readers absolutely should have in their collection, and Essential Ellison is one of them. Uh, so I, it, I thought it right to make the list. Uh, then we have a work of nonfiction. This is huge. Uh, it's Evolution, the first four billion years. This is edited by uh, Michael Ruse and Joseph Travis, with a forward by Edward Wilson. And this is a gigantic compendium of the latest research articles by a whole bunch of specialists on evolution by means of natural selection. What we know, not only about charismatic charismatic megafauna like dinosaurs, but also all sorts of other things. Uh, I have, the, the publisher sent me uh, the advanced copy of this thing, and I think I wrote about it. If I did, I will mem try to remember to leave a link to the review down below. Uh, and then I got rid of the hardcover. I got rid of the advanced copy, because it was kind of ugly, so I didn't want it. Then they sent me the finished copy, the hardcover, and I got rid of that because I told myself, no, you're, this, is, this is just too unwieldy. You're never actually going to use this. Uh, and then years later, they sent me the trade paperback, which publishers very seldom remember to do. And that one is the one that's on my shelf. Just the other day, I saw, or not the other day, last year, I saw a hard, the hardcover version of this thing in the Brattle sale lot for $3. And I actually checked to make sure that it wasn't mine. It wasn't. Somebody else unloaded that hardcover, probably for the same reason I did. Uh, but this is terrific. Now, some of these, a lot of these writers... Uh, don't know anything about writing for entertainment. They don't know anything about writing for a popular audience. You're going to have to stick with it through that. But it's ultimately incredibly fascinating as an overview of evolution. And also, in the 21st century, extremely necessary. Especially if you live in a science-denying country like the United States, where 180 million of your fellow citizens don't believe that evolution is even real. <laughs> they don't believe that it even happens. They think that animals are created by magic. They think that human beings were created by magic. That's pretty rough when you get to a situation where this thing could easily... I mean, communities not only openly hold public book-burning sessions now all across the south, the south and the west of the United States, but they proudly film them. They put the, they put the footage on YouTube. Uh, and this thing would get burned in a heartbeat. The, the, in any one of those, of those satanic rituals, this would get burned in a heartbeat. So all the more important to read... Uh, then we have a little bit of an older thing. This is an older anthology. It's actually comprised of two anthologies, but you can find it in a big volume. It's It was edited by Gardner Dozois, and it's called The Good Stuff. And it this is comprised of the old good stuff and the new good stuff. And this is a collection of science fiction novellas and novels and short stories. It's it's a science fiction anthology, obviously, as you can tell from the cover, which I think is Vincent Tefati, pretty sure. Uh, but the, the title for the original one for the original anthology here, derived from a particular refrain that science fiction readers often used to say to each other when they'd meet in bookstores or use bookstores, which is, you know, I, I know there's a lot of science fiction out there, but I only want the good stuff. <laughs> and that's what this anthology tries to put between two covers. Every science fiction reader will judge for themselves whether or not Gardner Dozois actually succeeds. I think this is infinitely revisitable as a science fiction anthology, one of only, again, about 30 science fiction anthologies that are infinitely revisible. Then we'll go to uh, the Emerald Isle, to the Old Sod. <laughs> this is the Penguin Book of Irish Fiction, edited by Colm Tobin, who is a great Irish writer on his own right. Uh, this is a big, fat compendium. It was made into a trade paperback by Penguin in the United States, big floppy trade paperback, that takes you from the beginnings all the way to down to the present day 
Uh, wonderfully chosen stuff. This is a big an anthology to really move in and live in, showing the the marvelous glow in the dark Irish heritage of great writing. Uh, one kind of great writing. And then our next one is another kind of great writing, also Ireland. This is Penguin Classics. This is the Penguin Book of, of Irish Poetry. Again, a thousand-page doorstopper, but Penguin makes it in a neat little trade paperback that is takes you chronologically and shows you uh, the riches, the incomparable riches of Irish poetry. Uh, those of you who don't know anything about Irish poetry, I should probably give you a little warning ahead of time that this is a bit of a downer <laughs> in terms of the book. Actually, the Calm to Bean book is too. A bit of a downer, <laughs> so, but you, you, you got to expect that. <laughs> so, uh, and it, it's also beautiful. The, the choices here are just beautifully done. Uh, then we'll move on to an actual anthology. It's something that's done for schools. Uh, the most famous of them in the United States is the Norton anthologies. Norton has a, a bustling business on college campuses where they do staple things like the Norton Anthology of American Literature, the Norton Anthology of the Short Story. They're tried and true things. Instructors will often order them in bulk. They also do the Norton Critical Editions of individual works. And the one I want to recommend today is the Norton Anthology of English Literature in two volumes. But I want to, I want to stress here the fourth edition, maybe the fifth edition. You want to look. See, that, that one. It, this is in two volumes. It's volume one and volume two. But you want to look carefully to make sure you're getting the right thing. An earlier edition, no later than, than the fifth edition. After that, academia and publishing houses started to become ideologically captured. The Norton anthologies of English literature that are made today are all but worthless because they subscribe to a far, an alt-left ideology that says there is an alternate canon. There is no alternate canon. There is no alternate canon. It, they, but they nevertheless subscribe to that delusion, which is that in, in Shakespeare's day, well known to the public, were female writers as good or better than Shakespeare writing and living by their pen. That did not factually happen. That is not actually factually true. But it doesn't matter. You'll never learn that in a modern anthology of any kind. In a modern anthology that's sanctioned by academia, you'll never learn that and of anything, whether it's a history of science or anything else. So you want to go back far enough so that lunacy had not taken over the primary buyer of these anthologies. Norton is just going to make the kind of anthology that the market will bear. You want to go back to a time when that market had not collectively lost its mind and started believing in an alternate reality in which there were, I don't know, experiments in Einsteinian physics being done by uh, uh, Ashanti people in 5th century AD. Uh, I, Things weird science fiction like that that people have just decided is true. You want to go back to an anthology that has canonical authors. Now, you might not like the fact that in the age of Chaucer or Dryden or Shakespeare, women were not being given systematic education or the artistic ability to flourish. I certainly don't like that fact. But it is, nevertheless, a fact. <laughs> it did, nevertheless, happen. So, if you'll know you're, that you've got the right Norton anthology, unfortunately, if the first volume, for instance, if you're doing two volumes of the, of, uh, the Norton anthology of English literature, the first volume should be 99.9% .9 male. 99.9% .9 white male. That is not good. And who knows what riches of literature and poetry we lost or never got, because those people, the immigrants, the, you know, minorities, uh, the Jews, women in England for a thousand years were not given either the, the ability or the freedom to write. We'll never know the jewels that we didn't get because that never happened, but we didn't get them. So the first, vol uh, the first volume in a two-volume set of English literature, if it's being conscientious to reality, will have almost nothing by women or anything but white men. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not evil. And you aren't evil if you read it and love those works. <laughs> but you're not going to get that in a modern Norton anthology, so you have to choose carefully. But I definitely recommend these earlier Norton anthologies. A lot of care and love went into them. They are wonderful. 
with their their stiff hardcovers and their onion skin pages. They are wonderful. Believe it or not, I know in a used bookstore or a yard sale, you might see an old, you know, somebody's school anthology like this and think, ah, no, 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 I'll wait to get the individual works. But they're worth getting. These are worth getting. For a dollar, they're worth getting. There's a lot of scholarship that goes into these. It's not just the works, of course. You get introductions to every period and to every individual author. You get tons and tons of great footnotes and all sorts of supporting material. Uh, the only caveat I would give, the only caution, is don't just snap them up. Because, as I said, they were used in schools. Which means they have a higher likelihood than most books you see in used bookstores or yard sales for having obnoxious neon highlighting all throughout them. Make sure you don't get a volume like that that you're never going to be able to read comfortably. <laughs> but, uh, but I recommend both volumes, if you can. Uh, then we'll go to uh, a famous anthology, one of the greatest anthologies. This one actually deserves a Penguin Classic of its own. This is the Oxford Book of English Verse. Now, I say that the Oxford Book of English Verse, the original version, the Quiller, edited by Quiller Cooch, should be a Penguin Classic. I also say that the first folio of Shakespeare should be a, a Penguin Classic. They aren't. Uh, Tyndall's Bible should be a, a Penguin Classic. Uh, it's weird. But the heresy, the, the odd thing to say, especially for a fan of Rumpel of the Bailey, as such as I am, is that uh, Quiller Cooch's version of the Oxford English, or the Oxford Book of English verse is not the best one. It's a very individual, very idiosyncratic, very personal collection. If your tastes in reading English poetry don't align with Quiller Cooch's, you're not going to like this volume or understand why half of the stuff that's in there is even in there. I would prefer going to the next one, to Helen Gardner's. Oxford Book of English first. This is also out of print. There, there have been two or three editions since then. This is lovely. And the, the supporting apparatus, the critical apparatus, is ten times better than the Quiller Cooch, which had none. Uh, so strongly recommend that, again, if you find it at a used bookstore. And then we will finish up with another book, like the Harlan Ellison, that is just one person. Uh, but it's so wonderful. It's so magical. I hate to use the word magical for the essential Ellison, but nevertheless, it's true. Got to give the devil his due. <laughs> and I don't have any problem using the word magic for this book. This was all by one person, but, oh, talk about an endless anthology. You can live in this thing for the for whole of your life. And the reason I know that is because I have done that. This is Peter Freuken's book, Book of the Seven Seas. And it's an older book. I don't think this has been reprinted in 50, 60 years. You, it has, this is its typical dust jacket, and you will find this at yard sales all the time. Attic sales. You won't find it at library book sales anymore because all, every library has de-accessed this thing. It's long since they don't have it on their shelves. I don't know why, but they don't. Uh, but you will find it at yard sales, attic sales, that sort of thing. It's, I imagine, not hard to come by secondhand on the, the secondhand online market, and it's delightful. The author was a famous explorer, and he we've seen him on this channel many times. We saw a recent biography of him. And in this book, he just goes over the oceans, their lore, their history, their appearance in ancient literature, their appearance in not-so-ancient literature, uh, maritime laws, different types of vessels, famous wrecks, famous monsters, famous disasters, just everything, everything you could possibly want, all in one huge, wonderful volume. So it's all by one person, yes, but I strongly, strongly recommend it. And there you go. That is a series of big, fat anthologies to complement the ones that Michael K. Vaughn held up. Uh, I think a lot of these would really suit you, right down to the ground. So I thought I'd do a response video. I seem to be doing a couple of those this, lately. Uh, and I will leave a link uh, to Michael's video down below. So I'll wrap this up for now, and I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.